Welcome back to our <clears throat> topic two uh, lectures on vision. This is subsection 2.4 on refraction and correction. And so we're going to talk about glasses here and corrective lenses. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I alluded to this a little bit when we talked about <clears throat> the retina and the functions of the cornea, the pupil, the lens uh, before the light reaches the retina. And I think I mentioned, uh, you know, these play a role in focusing the light so you get a nice crisp image right at the surface of the retina. And so the cornea and the lens consider these to be a system that bend light, just like a prism bends light or, you know, <clears throat> anytime light strikes a surface with a different index of refraction as they call it. Uh, that's a little physics blast from the past, I suppose. Um, so, uh, but in any case, this system bends the light so that there is basically the sharpest image possible right where the receptors need to be able to distinguish very sharp imagery. And so if this focal point rests right on the retina. This is when humans get that a, a crisp visual image versus one that's a little that's blurry right <clears throat> okay so I, I mentioned there's a system here so the term we're going for here is a re refraction refraction means bending of light and then in this case so that it focuses on the retina refraction is just bending of light we're refracting to focus on the retina um, the cornea does most of that light bending and the rest of that light bending is comes from the lens. The interesting difference also, though, is the cornea is pretty constant. It doesn't really move. The lens is flexible and it changes the depth of the um, uh, uh, of the focus, um, the focal point. <clears throat> so that's something that our eyes control through the process of accommodation. All right. Okay. All right, good. So, um, right. So as the lens changes, uh, uh, it will either bend that light more so or less. So when we are looking as far away as we possibly can, if we say we're looking at optical infinity, so I'm looking out on the horizon and I'm trying to see as far away as I can, I may be straining to see detail out there, but I am not straining to bring something into focus. So for the interior eye muscles that bring things into focus, the strain comes when you're up close and the pressure on the muscles here have to, have to basically um, you know, thicken the lens so that it bends light to a greater extent. And this is where we get that tension as we try to bring our finger closer and closer and keep it, you know, uh, keep it in focus. Um, it gets harder and harder to do that the closer we get. And in fact, the older we get, the harder it gets to do this. And we'll talk more about that in this lecture also. <clears throat> All right. Okay, the, the resting state of accommodation, this is kind of like our human factors ideal. Um, you will be at that state more or less um, when um, you're looking at optical infinity. Um, but there is a certain distance where, okay, in complete darkness, where does your eye kind of naturally rest in terms of where it would focus light uh, if you had images there? So obviously your eyes will, will focus on things at whatever plane of depth. It's hard to say, well, where am I at my completely relaxed state if you're trying to look at something? So in complete darkness, they've measured this. So it's at about 80 centimeters, 31 and a half inches. Basically, I know you can't see, I'm about this far from the screen in front of me. Maybe that's a little bit less, but that's pretty close to about the ideal distance. Um, it's also basically, uh, you know, uh, if you were to sit at most computer desks and there's a natural place where the monitor goes and there's a natural depth at which you see, sit, that's probably going to be pretty close to this resting state. If it's not, you could re, you know, you could redesign your, your workstation here to make a little bit better of a viewing uh, condition. So the reason it's better is because at this depth, your eyes are doing the least amount of effort to change 
focal planes. Okay, so bending the shape of that lens, changing the shape of the lens to accommodate things that are further away or or closer. Um, your eyes are basically doing the least amount of effort if you have that depth be at about 31 and a half inches. Um, also, you're minimizing that effort if you, sorry, if you don't, if you don't move too much closer and, and further away from the thing, if you stay pretty consistent, you're also doing yourself a, a favor. And how do you know that you're experiencing visual fatigue? You may feel like, well, at the end of the day, I see just as well as the beginning of the day. Um, but if you ever feel that um, kind of, it's, it's not necessarily going to affect how, um, pre how, how, um, how, how crisp an image might be, but it would affect like the, the muscles in the eye, you know, as far as, you know, if you're changing planes of, of focus, that's where you would really feel, you know, this sort of, that sort of tension in, in those eye muscles. Okay. Yeah. So that's visual fatigue is basically the fatigue of the muscles in the eye that change the shape of the lens. That's, you know, one of the, the primary contributors there. <clears throat> Okay, so um, uh, one time when I was teaching on this topic, somebody brought up this concept of the Harmon distance, and I hadn't heard of it before. Um, and as it uh, as it turns out, um, there is not only an ideal viewing sort of um, um, distance, there's also an ideal viewing angle. And the interesting thing about this, and I, I, I'll put it up on not eCampus on Canvas, um, but it's it's the idea of things like, well, how, what, how, when do you maximize blood flow to the brain um, based on what sort of posture? Um, and so this is kind of combining the visual distance and making sure you get enough blood to the brain sort of posture. And so the rule of thumb is it's a length of, you know, about that, that, that fist to elbow distance. Um, so anyway, I'll post, I'll post uh, the article on that and you can read and learn about it and see for yourself if you think it sounds reasonable. I'm, I think this is kind of a, um, kind of a pros and cons sort of uh, uh, article there. So interesting. All right, <clears throat> back to bending light. Okay, so the cornea and the lens bend light. Um, but sometimes for some of us, me included, um, in my eyes natural state, they don't come to a completely satisfactory crispness of imagery. Um, and so I can use other lenses to bend the light in front of my eyes. Okay. Um, and so we'll talk about lenses in terms of how much can, or how much does a lens bend a light inward or outward. Okay. Uh, so con converges or diverges light, right? So the, uh, the basically it's a, you know, a Based, based on the shape and the material of the lens, um, they can get this very precise when you order lenses from, you know, um, you know, eye care specialists and they, and they order them. And the reason you can't just make them in your, in your garage is they're very precisely shaped. And that's why you get like a prescription, you know, for them. All right. So the units that we're talking about here are going to be diopters. Uh, and I will show you, I hope you got that there. Oh, I guess that's coming up in a minute. Um, but dioptric power um, is another, you know, an AKA for refractive power. So if I ask you, what is the power, the refractive power, the dioptric power, we're basically talking about how much does it bend, converge or diverge light. Um, and so this is directly related to a linear distance um, over between the lens and the focal point of the bent light. Okay. So if the light is coming from the left side and moving rightward, a convex lens or one that we call positive lens plus, you know, positive means it is bending things inward and negative means it is bending things outward. It's converging them, but it's a little confusing because you have to think of a negative lens as having a focal length just on the in the negative direction. Um, so F being the distance between the lens and where all of the light, you know, striking the lens would come to a common point. Um, they, they call that the focal length. So that's F here. That's this red. And the refractive power, which is the metric that we usually think of when we say 
this is how strong that lens is, uh, is the reciprocal of that. Um, and it will be positive or negative as well as the focal length being positive or negative. So just, you need to just make sure that you've got, you're reporting it appropriately as a positive or negative power. And that entirely has to do with, are we bending light inward or outward? Now, if you ever get confused on that, you want to, I mean, I get confused on that. And so one way to remember is that if you go to the, um, you know, if you go to like a drugstore, Walgreens, CVS, whatever, and, and go to the section where they have, you know, $5 pairs of reading glasses, and some of us maybe are even needing to buy those and purchase them and use them to read, they are always positive plus 2.50 this is the refractive power of the lenses in this, in this pair of glasses. Reading glasses are always magnifiers. They always make things look larger. And so they're always positive. And so positive goes with a convex lens. So this is how my brain goes. I was like, oh yeah, in order to read things, they have to be larger. So that's a positive and that's a positive lens. And then if you can link that then to the, the convex Hopefully you can wrap your head around all of that, but whatever, in any case, don't, don't uh, forget to check, am I representing this focal length and therefore the um, refractive power as a positive or a negative quantity that matters. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> here we go. So a little more explanation here. Um, so if, you know, there was a focal length of 50 centimeters, uh, so like a convergent lens, a convex lens here. So if F was 50 centimeters, then you would calculate one divided by F, one divided by 0.5 meters is 2.0 diopters. That is the unit that we're talking about here, a diopter. And diopter is mathematically equivalent to the inverse of a meter. So it's gotta be in meters, okay? Don't, don't confuse, you know, don't use uh, in British units here. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, so it's got to be in meters. I mean, remember that centimeters are just, you know, um, tenths of, of meter and millimeters are just thousandths of a meter. Um, so we can calculate, for example, what um, distance we need over which the lens system, that is the cornea and I'm sorry, the cornea and the lens, uh, which refract the light that enter the eye over the focal distance of the depth of the eye. And so based on you know, human anatomy, um, we know that the depth of the cornea for an adult is roughly 17 millimeters. And there's gonna be some variances, but if we know that's, that's pretty close, we can think then, well, then how much refractive power does the cornea and lens system need so that there's this nice crisp image um, by focusing right on the retina? <clears throat> So if I'm looking at optical infinity, meaning, you know, my resting state, I'm looking as far away as I can. Um, and so my, my, the, my eye is bending light the least. So this is ideally what you want if you want to get, get your vision corrected is have when I'm in my looking furthest away, I'm getting focus on, on this point, like right on the edge because I can't control, I can't relax any more than my most relaxed state. So in your most relaxed state, you want that to be well-tuned. And so you want to be at a focal point there. Very commonly, because the human eye is a weird thing and we're each individuals, that focal point doesn't naturally rest exactly on the retina. There's some correction that, that helps us there. All right, so going back to the example here, if I'm looking as far away as I can, and I have a 17 millimeter depth eye, and I see everything very nice and clearly, then I can conclude that, oh, well, you have to bend the light to come to a focal point over the distance of 17 millimeters. So the reciprocal of that, remember I'm using this equation right here, the reciprocal is 59 and so that's my that's my unit diopters 59 diopters also equivalent to let me just write it um sorry just a sec also equivalent to 59 inverse meters okay 
mathematically equivalent that way. So, so we'll say diopters, but when you're doing the math, you need to be thinking of this as an inverse of a meter, right? Because here's meter right here, right? Okay, good. Okay, um, all right. Now we can measure the cornea with existing sorts of like imagery based things. If you go to the ophthalmologist, they can literally scan and 3D surface of your cornea and tell you, well, based on the shape of this cornea, um, you know, here's the, the dioptric power, the refractive power of just the cornea. And then everything else, if you remember, is left up to the lens. So the cornea, it's not going to move. It's going to be pretty static, pretty constant. But the lens can change shape. And so if we need to resolve something at a certain depth, the lens is doing all the work for us. Okay. Now, as we age, just like everything on our bodies, the lens starts to be less reliable. It's, it gets stiffer. It gets weaker. I mean, the, the muscles around the lens get weaker. And this accounts for, and we're going to talk more about this later, so I don't want to spoil it too much. But this accounts for the reason why when you start to be about 40, you, we all need to start be thinking about reading glasses. If we live long enough, our lenses will fail and we will need help resolving things that are up close. Okay, but let's just say we're very young children. We have very healthy uh, lenses and they're extremely flexible and we have strong eye muscles because we're very young. Um, so at that, at, at, at that degree of resilience in, in the, um, you know, in, in the tissue, um, you could have up to 36 diopters of bendable of, of, of refraction of refractive power. Um, and so this just gives us the full range of what we could expect. So we need 59 diopters if our eyes are 17 millimeters what this is showing is 43 for the most part is covered and so in order to get to 59 we need at least the ability to flex over 16 you know i'm doing 59 minus 43 equals 16 diopters additionally we need from the lens as a very young child no problem it can handle that range as we age, that range from I can I can go from, you know, zero additional diopters to 36 additional diopters, whatever is needed in the flexibility of my lens. But as we age, that high end uh, creeps down, and then pretty soon we you know we have trouble resolving things up close that we normally or in the past had no pro no problems with. So as we age, that's getting smaller. All right. <clears throat> so yes, I can. I think I kind of. Uh, explain this already, but in addition to talking, sorry, I got to delete this. Where are my drawings? Okay. Um, in addition to talking about bending light, you know, by the by the retina, I'm sorry, by the um, by the cornea and lens system, we can put an additional lens in front of the light, and so therefore it can help us focus uh, at things that are nearer to us or further away, depending on you know. Um, uh, on our condition. Okay. All right. So in the previous lecture, we talked about color vision and we talked about how there's a lot of people in the world who don't see color the same way as others. And those are people in our workforce and it's some of you probably. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is my turn to say I've, I've lived a life of uh, of eyes that have been good and bad and then good again. Um, and so refractive error is a major part of a lot of humans and, and they can get around the world just fine because we have technologies that can help us correct when we have error in our natural eye systems. So, but we do say if somebody has a condition that needs lenses to correct it, um, then we, are, we have some form of refractive error. Okay, so that's something that, you know, may be distinguishable refractive error from something like presbyopia, which is a term that I haven't said yet, but I've talked about it. Um, so presbyopia, that's this shrinking of our, our range that I mentioned on the previous slide, our, our range of, of um, refractive power in the lens. Um, that's not really a refractive error. It's more a degradation of the range of 
of correction that our lens can do, but it's not at a resting state. You need to be, you know, you need a little help moving the focal point closer to, you know, the retina in one direction or the other. So I'll show you, I think I have a picture here. There we go. This is a good example of my focal point not resting right on the retina. And this is the condition that I've had my, my entire life or at, at times. And also I'll tell you why it's, I've had very, very myopic vision until I was about 20 years old. Then I had LASIK. And then 20 years later, I need glasses again. <laughs> so I've lived two phases of life where I've been myopic. Um, and there's a number of reasons behind that. Um, that's why I have an ophthalmologist friend <laughs> that I get to talk to a lot about this stuff. All right. So in any case, if the light is bent too much at a, re at a natural state, at a resting state, then we call this myopia. Myopia is the medical term. Uh, nearsightedness is the common colloquial term, right? Um, so, and, and the essence of this is the muscles can't relax enough to have the natural resting focal point be on the retina. Basically, the tension that we feel, remember, is squishing this lens so that it bends light more. And so if this is, I'm trying to look as far away as I possibly can, and things aren't coming into focus, it's because at a relaxed, at, at a, I'm maximally relaxed, right, with the muscles in my eye, I am getting a blurry image that, that reaches my retina. So I want to use some sort of correction here to bend the light less, so to speak, or we actually want to diverge the light so that when it converges, this focal point can effectively be moved closer to the retina, back, basically, further away from the, from the lens and closer to the retina. All right. All right, good. Hyperopia is the opposite uh, issue, okay? So with this case, um, this is, you know, farsightedness is the colloquial term, um, but this is, uh, you know, the, you can't get enough tension on the, the lens to make it bend enough to resolve things up close. So this is not the same thing as age-related, the need for reading glasses, but somebody who is hyperopic or has hyperopia um, would have trouble without glasses seeing things up close and would have let, little problem seeing things far away, okay? Myopia, which is what I ha have had, gives me no problem seeing things up close so I can read at night with my glasses off, piece of cake. Um, but if I need to see my son you know, playing soccer, I can't identify which one he is without my glasses. <laughs> okay, so here we're going to get lensy again. So I mentioned again, don't forget you need that positive or negative. You got to carry that sign with you when you're doing the math about how um, refractive power works. So this is all about is the focal point in front of or behind the, uh, the lens with regard to the direction of the light. Um, so here I am, this is me with myopia. Some of you maybe also the nearsighted. This is the one where I can see up close, okay, further away I have trouble. Um, the focal point uh, you know, of my natural resting eye state uh, is not at the, at the retina. And so I need to add a negative lens to diverge the light. So the light comes from this side and it passes through, it diverges, it goes, you know, spreads out. And therefore, when the light reaches my pupil, it's more net, it's more spread out, so that the natural curvature and lens system bends the light just so all right, good. Now it reaches the retina, right? For hyper, excuse me, for hyperopia, we need a positive lens. This is also, again, what happens when people are, need reading glasses. It's also a positive lens, makes things appear larger. And effectively, what it's doing for everyday glasses is it's moving that focal point closer to the, um, to the lens and to, to the retina and the lens um, by bending the light more so. So it converges some of the light to a certain degree. It gives a little you know, extra oomph to the system here that has to has to, uh, to refract it the rest of the way. All right. 
I made this uh, a while ago. I, I think it's a pretty, I like to use it. I, I, I hope it helps illustrate kind of those of you who have worn glasses, you'll understand this better. You know, the it's blurry and oh, now it's crisp. Some of you who have never needed corrective lenses, you probably put on somebody else's glasses and went, whoa, that's blurry. And then, oh, now I can see well again. So this is all about kind of what those lenses are doing to your visual experience. I'm trying to explain that here. All right, so if I'm myopic, right here I am, I better, I better be myopic right now. Okay, so I've got, you know, the, uh, uh, the focal point's not quite reaching my retina, and I'm trying to look at this apple that's on the counter. It's not too far away, I know it's an apple, I'm looking at it. Okay, so the light from that apple reaches my cornea and enters, and the light, the light is pure, there's nothing wrong with the light, it's only how my eye interprets that light, right? And so on, my, on the other side, I'm not getting a good focus on the retina. I still get light imagery, but it doesn't come into this nice, crisp, you know, detailed uh, image, like as if this were to strike right on the retina. Okay. So what do I do? I get my negative lens, let negative lens to correct, uh, to correct myopia. There we go. Now the light that enters, that passes through the lens that comes from the apple, uh, is essentially getting diverged. And so it's going to effectively, you know, spread out the light imagery. So it's like this. Oops, wrong way. Sorry. And so effectively, the way you can think about this negative lens is it's kind of like a funnel. It's kind of how I think of it. Like the light coming in kind of shrinks and then is diverged. This is just how I think of it. It's <laughs> please. Uh, if you're confused, let's talk in office hours. If you know optics better than me, don't use my examples because I'm probably misrepresenting it just the way I think of it. So if the light is coming, you know, from a broader area and it's being, you know, essentially um, um, condensed and diverged like this, here I am representing the light shrinking. That's my attempt. So it shrinks in a way. And then, wow, that image becomes very nice and crisp. Uh, and so this is my way of describing one of the things I found. I, I'm not very myopic right now. When I was a child, I was legally blind. <laughs> and I'll tell, you'll see what that means when I show the, uh, in the next topic where we talk about uh, visual acuity. Um, but one of the big things was when I would put the glasses on, things would become clearer, but also smaller. And that was something that always struck me. And so I, I, I tried to work through that in my head. And this is, this is my interpretation approximation. So where before I had, oops, let's go back, you know, the correct size, but blurry, I put my glasses on and I get this nice crisp image, but it was always smaller. And so this is how I would uh, potentially explain that. Um, this also then affects, you know, if you are observing somebody, I know right now these, these lenses are not very high power. Again, I, I mentioned I had LASIK. And so I have just very benign, very mild myopia now. Um, and, but you can't tell as much with these lenses. But when I was a child and I wore my clonkers, you definitely could tell um, that when you look at somebody, you know, who's wearing glasses and not to make those of you who are like me any self-conscious or anything, but this is why eyes behind the lenses tend to look either minified or magnified. Um, and so here, this is what a, um, a negative lens will do. That's, you know, again, you can't tell very much with these lenses, but my eyes are slightly smaller behind them. Um, and if you are hyperopic and you have a positive lens for correction, that's when people look like bubbles and they have, you know, the bubbles, the character, right? Uh, they have their, uh, uh, their eyes look larger. They look magnified. This is also the reading glasses effect, right? Okay. All right, so refractive error can be myopia, can be hyperopia, or it can be astigmatism. These three are things that I would call refractive error. Anything else where I'm talking about visual uh, corrections are not necessarily to correct, correct the fact that in a natural rested state, the light is not focused perfectly on your retina, okay? So it's either in front of, and then that would be myopia, behind, and that's hyperopia, or sort of scattered, and then that's what astigmatism is. So astigmatism occurs when you have multiple 
focal points based on either imperfections or distortions in the curvature of usually of the cornea. Okay. Um, this can occur in addition to myopia or hyperopia. Um, I have had astigmatism in my life. I also had that surgically corrected. It's probably still here to some extent, but not too bad. Um, and, uh, and so this is basically, you know, this is an example of what it might be like. Some of you may say, oh yeah, I have astigmatism. I never knew what that meant. I don't think I knew exactly what that meant until I studied it in the human factors context. Um, but it's a reason why it's hard to resolve things, you know, with clarity. And there's two basic ways this can happen. One can be, you know, you have an injury. So that would be it, what we call irregular astigmatism. That's like you get poked in the eyes or something and there's damage. And then that would cause obviously changes in the, uh, you know, in how the, in how the cornea might refract light. Um, but probably more commonly, regular astigmatism is, you know, you have a nice um, um, curve, curved, you know, not irregular shape, but the shape is elongated somehow. So it's not a perfect sphere. Uh, and it's round like a football, right? And so then if you can think of this as like, um, taking an image and sort of stretching it, um, that's a good way to think of what is naturally happening with the astigmatic eye and an eye with astigmatism. And this is also very correctable, right? So if we talk about astigmatism, it's usually, you know, a, a, it's, uh, it's usually related to the degree of, I, I guess you call distortion um, from, from a perfect spherical shape. And then also the axis on, you know, over which it's um, secondary radius would be okay. So I guess, you know, let me use the right terms, the, the, the longer meridian, okay, of this semi spherical uh, shape here. So, uh, and I guess they, they make this in, in, you know, they have a, here's zero degrees, and let's go, you know, I don't know what the difference is between zero and 180 degrees. But you do see that. So just, I won't make you distinguish those two, but know that the angle does matter. Um, very much so because you have to have then a lens that will correct that distortion according to the proper angle as well. So if somebody has astigmatism, uh, that's regular astigmatism and they have correction in their lenses, if they take their lens and they pivot it, they put it on a different angle, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to correct like, like they're designed for. So you need to get that axis correct as well. <clears throat> All right. And here we go. Let's correct it. Um, so when we talk about spherical correction, here we go, All right? Um, so spherical correction means depth. So am I needing to bend light more so or less uh, in order to, you know, come to a resting point on the retina? So that's spherical correction, all right? For astigmatism, you have a cylinder correction, and this is to account for the distortion along along the longer axis. So you can imagine this, if I have a 90 degree um, uh, astigmatism like this, and I have a lens, a cylinder lens that I can orient this way, let's, let's go with, you know, I have one of these cylinder lenses, I'm effectively taking that vertical meridian and I'm making it, you know, more closer to this, the, uh, the horizontal meridian, that, that's the idea, is how much do you bend along one axis? And then we call that cylinder correction. So if you can take these two, these two uh, three-dimensional shapes and combine them, you get, and this is my example here, it's like if you sliced off the edge of a donut, um, this is called a toric lens. So it has both the spherical correction properties and the cylinder correction properties. Um, and this is what you're paying somebody to create that costs hundreds of dollars, um, you know, when you go to the ophthalmologist. And if you have a prescription that requires, uh, you know, both spherical correction and astigmatism correction, this is why it's a complex, complex thing. Uh, all right. So I've already mentioned uh, my uh, LASIK surgery and not to freak you guys out, um, but uh, this is essentially what happens. Um, the cornea, which again does most of the work in refracting refractive power, um, is if if that is I mean, that that typically remains static. If that doesn't quite have enough curvature, 
you know, so that you need a lot of correction. Um, one of the solutions here is to change the curvature of the cornea itself. And so LASIK is basically removing the cornea. This is a very um, well uh, 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 oxygenated um, um, tissue, so it heals very quickly. But this is literally peel back the top layer, not mm, freak you out a little bit, and then stare at the flashing light, which is actually a laser that is vaporizing your, your flesh. I speak from experience here, not to dissuade anybody. <laughs> it's very, it changed my life. I know lots and lots of people, including my wife, who have had LASIK. Um, I had it in the early years before it's been, I think, quite, quite a bit improved. Um, so I don't want to freak anybody out. Very, very big deal, positive thing in my life. Um, but in my case, didn't, didn't quite stick. Um, but yeah, you are looking at a flashing light while you're awake and realize that that flashing light is, a, is vaporizing your, your tissue. And it's reshaping the, the structure underneath the cornea. And then when the cornea is replaced, it heals. And now your eye is, is like you're wearing contact lenses all the time. Um, so very you know, dramatic improvement in my life when I had that done, uh, because like I, I mentioned earlier, I was legally blind. I, I was so myopic that I could probably see about this far in front of my face um, with, with clarity, um, without my glasses. All right, there we go. Okay, good. So I mentioned myopia, hyperopia, astigmatism. These three are refractive error. Presbyopia, new term, right? I guess I've said it a few times already. This is not refractive error. See that right there? Um, it is a condition that affects our ability to resolve detail. But refractive error is about a shift. I'm shifting a focal point. Presbyopia describes a reduction as we age in the range over which our lenses can help us resolve things. Okay. So this is happening to me now. The, this is, I, I used to say, hey, you know how your parents do this? Now I'm saying, you know how we do this, <laughs> you know, um, but the, uh, the need to hold things further away, the, if you're trying to read something comfortably and you start to think, why am I, why is it easier for me to hold this at arm's length? I'm doing this with like menus at restaurants now. And it's, a, it's because of presbyopia. So what's happening here is the ability to resolve things up close gradually becomes a harder and harder thing to do as we have as we age the lenses become stiffer more brittle less fluid and flexible the muscles that change the shape of, of the lens and again remember looking up close is really smushing the lens right and so <laughs> you need strong muscles and you need flexible um, tissue there um, and at some point we we lose the ability to smush it to the same degree that we could when we were younger. Um, and so what that means is you, we can still see at distance just fine. Um, you know, I have corrective lenses that allow me to see very far right now. And as I age, I don't expect that to change, right? And I, I think no, no, you don't have to expect that to change. It's only gonna be the close end that we start to lose. And so, but we also have technology for that. We have reading glasses, we have bifocal lenses. With, which help with reading things, you know, because they're um, magnifying things that would otherwise, that are up close. All right, good. So I mentioned here, it's like a shifting uh, uh, refractive error is. So I like to use this example again to kind of illustrate how it's different. So if this is me and I can see this apple up close, no problem. I can see it further away, no problem. Um, and if we say I am your average young well-seeing person with 20-20 acuity, it would look like this. Now, if I have myopia, effectively that means my the range over which I can resolve things near or far is about the same, but that, that entire range, I'm much more comfortable close, close up, right? So myopia, meaning I take my glasses off and I can't see my son on the soccer field, but I can read things up close just great, right? So the same case, you know, with this person here, who I guess is me also. So, <laughs> all right. Um, hyperopia, naturally have problems with things up close. No problem seeing things far away. And I think this is a fair thing to show. Some people with hyperopia actually can see further away than, 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 than somebody who's 20-20, you know, in an average, you know, an average 
viewer, let's say. So this is conceivable, um, but it's not a good, you know, it's not beneficial in life to have, uh, I, I think, something, you know, where it's harder to uh, uh, resolve things up close. Now, presbyopia versus hyperopia, here's the difference. So presbyopia, I can see the same things far away, no problem, but that's what I start to lose is my is my front end is is I start to lose it's harder and harder to resolve things I'm going like this with the menu so I can see it you know all right there we go okay so what do we do about it because you know some of you may think hey this is like uh why do I have to worry about this I'm 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 my, I see great you know 10 15 years you're going to need these <laughs> um so uh but in any case yes so um we have easy, affordable ways to correct presbyopia when it occurs in all of us. Uh, reading glasses are easily, uh, uh, you know, accessed. You can buy them just at the drugstore down the street. Um, interesting question here. So human factors, uh, take a minute and think about it. Why are all reading glasses shaped like they are, like this? What's the deal with that? You know, they don't look like these glasses. They don't look like your everyday wear glasses. Why is that? And if you're paused to think about it, come on back. It is, of course, because we have to be able to look disapprovingly at people across the room, right? No, it's, a, it's because when we read, the natural position for reading, is your eyes are pointed downward, right? So typically, if I'm reading something and I'm holding it, I'm not holding it up here as a natural resting state. I'm holding it here. And if I can read by looking down like this through my glasses, I can still look, these are like magnifying glasses if they're, if they're you know, they're, it's like a magnifying lens um, for um, if I'm wearing them, it's going to be hard for me to see further away through magnifying lenses. So I need to be able to shift between, okay, I can see far away, no problem. Oh, and I got to, if I got to read something, then I can look down through my lenses. So reading glasses shape allow those two modes of vision to, to, to work well. This is also why with bifocal glasses, the magnifying portion is always on the bottom part of the lens. It's, it's, it, doesn't, it wouldn't make sense to have it you know, anywhere else. Okay. I like to ask questions about eyeglass prescription because now that you know all of the measures and metrics, you can see where these come from. So those of you who, uh, you know, have a prescription for lenses, you can interpret what's going on with them now. So here's an example. This is just a, a made up one, but it's, I guess it'd be a pretty typical. So how do you read this thing, right? So OD is Oculus Dexter, okay? Like Dexter from Dexter's Laboratory, the right eye, right? Uh, Dexter means right, whatever reason. Oculus Sinister, that's, I love it. So think of, you know, the left eye, the left being the opposite of the right. And then in like, you know, historic medieval times, whatever, left is evil. I, I tease my, my mom is left-handed. So we have all kinds of sinister, you know, jokes about her all the time. Um, but I hope it doesn't come from me, but the idea of left being evil, <laughs> that's how I can remember this OS Oculus Sinister goes with the left. Okay. Uh, all right. Next. What's the first number? Tell me. Oh, yeah. So remember, I, I mentioned you, you really got to keep straight. Are we doing a negative lens or a positive lens uh, for the refractive power? That really matters. It's totally opposite if you don't have the right sign there. So you need a positive lens to correct for hyperopia. That's, again, um, I, I cannot see far away very well. Uh, or I'm sorry. I can see far away very well. I have trouble up close. I need a magnifying image, just like with reading glasses. Uh, negative lens for myopia. Uh, and so the negative here says this is somebody with myopia. The next number is the spherical power. So again, this is how much do we correct in terms of um, uh, the, the, the depth, right? So do I need more convergence or, le or, or, or divergence of light? Um, so that's the spherical power next. So it's a negative, it's a negative lens with 3.5 diopters as its refractive power. It's as its spherical refractive correction, sp spherical correction. So that's expressed first. Then here's our 
astigmatism numbers, okay? So what this shows is this person has two different needs for spherical power in the two different eyes. They also have two slightly different types of astigmatism. So both in terms of the amount of dioptric power that, or the refractive power that needs to be corrected, and this is the axis over which that um, that astigmatism exists. Remember that's so. This is negative. That would be a concave lens um, at negative one at, at one diopter of refractive power, oriented at 180 degrees. As I mentioned, I don't know the difference between zero and 180 degrees, but this is what we're talking about here. That axis. Of, of how the um, how the astigmatism is oriented. And that would be then the axis over which one of these lenses either you know this uh, um, uh, either of these cylinder lenses would be oriented. Okay. All right, good. And that's yeah in degrees. Lastly, if there are, there's a need for bifocals, and this is commonly the case, right? Especially, I'm, I'll probably need them in my next pair of glasses, honestly. <laughs> um, and so if, you know, presbyopia starts to become a thing, that's where you get this indicator here in the corner. Uh, you know, notice that it doesn't have a plus here because the amount of correction for a presbyopia is always a positive lens. It's always about resolving the, the near end uh, more easily by magnifying the image. So this is a two diopter uh, um, um, bifocal insert. Okay. Now I, I mentioned several times, hey, this is like magnifying lens. And if you've ever played with a magnifying lens, you, you'll notice that it, it doesn't make your vision really great over distances, but you can find that spot where you get a nice crisp image. And, and so this is a positive lens, just like a, um, you know, like we've been talking about all just like that. Um, and so now when we talk about, well, how do things that are really far away look big? Okay. Or how, how you know, how do we bend light for that? So binoculars, right? So I'm looking I'm thinking now binoculars are a compound lens system. It's more than just usually with a magnifying lens, it's just one lens. Um, but how does this ultimately work? Um, and so I, I do want to kind of bring those two worlds together a little bit because we're talking about refracting light to come into focus on the on the retina. But magnification, you know, using these lens system is also about bending light to make it appear crisp at a certain distance and, you know, and, and also larger. So I'll, I'll show you how these two work together. So um, magnification, and if we say like, I've got 10x binoculars, right? That's, that's something that you could, you, you can purchase binoculars based on their magnification power. Magnification power and refractive power are not the same thing. They are related though, and I've got an equation coming here. Um, but just to understand what we mean by magnification power. So 10x magnification, you can think of as two different interpretations with regard to this class. So I see this image Godzilla, it is a certain distance away. And then I'm going to get out my binoculars. And now the image is either going, to, so now the, the image to my retina has just become larger. Okay. Um, so you could say that with 10 times magnification, it is 10 times larger, but this is equivalent in terms of what our retina gets as far as the light that strikes it. 10 times larger is equivalent to 10 times closer, okay? So generally, if something is really, really far away, um, the math kind of approximates out so that if it were twice as tall, it's it's almost identical to having it be half the distance, three times as tall, or, you know, I guess a third the distance, right? Um, so, because if you think about it, so again, watch my Godzilla example, um, you know, if he's either closer or taller, the line of sight and the pattern of reflected light that is reaching my retina is going to be the same. And so this is a little bit of a foreshadowing also that when we talk about size and depth cues, the, 
pattern of light on the retina is not enough for us to know is something big or is it close, right? Uh, and so we'll talk about other cues that are used to determine that. But this is interesting now because if I can interchangeably talk about, well, if the image was 10 times larger or 10 times closer, maybe I know the height, but not the distance, or maybe I know the distance, but not the height. And if you know you can, these are interchangeable, you've got another um, you know, way to solve some of the problems. You know, I'll just say that for your homework. All right. So here's the equation that you wanna you know, use if it says, hey, convert magnifying power to refractive power. I told you they're not the same thing. Um, generally, so 10x, this is a good, this is 10, this is magnifying power of 10. Um, this is the same, uh, okay, so, so how can I represent that in terms of how much refractive power does the magnifying system give us? Um, we start with a reference distance, and I think this has to do with like basically if I was viewing something with a magnifying glass, there's this standard dif distance about 10 inches. So what, for whatever reason, that's our standard di distance. Multiply that times refractive power in diopters. You remember diopters have units, or diopters are mathematically equivalent to the inverse of a meter. So 0 0.25 meters times something to the, with an inverse meter, they cancel out. And then add one. And we add one because magnification is about um, relative to, like if you had 1x magnification, it would be um, essentially saying, you have the dioptric power to see something at 10 inches, perfectly at 10 inches. <laughs> so, um, okay, so 2.5 diopter reading glasses, 2.5 here, what does that mean? Um, so I know the diopters, uh, what is this gonna do as far as the images I'm looking at trying to read through them? So again, 2.5 diopters is 2.5 inverse meters. I multiply those two together, I add one, this is telling me it's gonna be 1.625X magnified. That's basically saying it will be 62.5% larger in, in terms of how much it's magnified. So then what does that mean for binoculars, 10X binoculars? We can do the same uh, equation in reverse and then we get, oh, that's about 36 diopters. Okay, that is, I believe that's it for this one. Thanks, tune in for next time.